Today I'm going to present our recent work on the development of multiplex inhibitor beads that we've used to develop a method to measure whole kinome activation in mass. And then the rationale for this was that there's over 130 targeted kinase inhibitors currently in clinical trials. But there's no way until now to comprehensively characterize kinases whose activation state is affected by inhibition of nodal kinases in cells and tissues. In other words, how does the inhibition of a specific kinase influence other kinases within the cell? And then you can use RNA-seq to measure expression, but that doesn't measure kinase activity. Phosphoproteomics measures phosphorylation, but it doesn't give a measure of dynamic kinase activity. There's also a clinical need to be able to measure the activation state and changes in the activation state of the entire kinome. And single agent kinase inhibitors generally do not have a durable response and resistance rapidly develops. In fact, in the clinic today, even though some kinase inhibitors have very strong initial responses with the shrinkage of a specific tumor, they do not have a durable response and resistance develops. So what needs to be done is you either have to identify tumors with exquisite single agent sensitivity without alternative pathways where one drug could be used, and even in highly oncogenic addicted tumors such as HER2 positive breast cancer, drugs like Herceptin, you still develop resistance within a short period of time. The alternative is to identify redundant and compensatory pathways that become activated in response to single agent inhibition that would allow you to make rational predictions for combination or combinatorial strategies. Alan, our goal was to develop better assays that are able to measure the systematic kinome response in cells to targeted pathway inhibition. And we wanted to use these methods to measure the activation state of the kinome in mass. To address this goal and to view to the extent possible the kinome and its activation state as a whole, we've combined multiple recent technologies. These include using kinome RNAi screening assays in cultured cells to look for a synthetic enhancement or to try to identify specific vulnerabilities within the kinome for different cancer subtypes. We combine this with next generation RNA sequencing in genetically engineered mouse models, human tumors, and cell lines to identify the expressed kinases in those particular cells and tumors. This would represent the expression state at an RNA level of the kinome. But more importantly, we have devised a pan-kinome analysis method using what we call uh, multiplexed inhibitor beads, where we use a number of different pan-kinase inhibitors to capture activated protein kinases and analyze them quantitatively using mass spectrometry. So how do you study the activity of the kinome, its activation state? So we use these multiplexed inhibitor beads, and these are custom synthesized where we place an appropriate sidearm in the kinase inhibitor so that we can immobilize it to a sephiros bead without influencing the ability of the inhibitor to bind to the active side of the specific kinase. And then multiplex inhibitor beads coupled with quantitative mass spectrometry has allowed us to assess kinome activation dynamics. It provides an unparalleled measurement of kinome dynamics, both activation and inhibition of the kinome. And then these are methods that were first developed by CellZone and also worked by Henrik Dov and Matthias Mann to look at on-target, off-target behavior of kinase inhibitors using purified kinases or cell extracts. We've extended these methods to study the behavior behavior of the kinome in intact cells, animals, and tumors, and virtually any tissue type that you want to study. On the left is a figure showing how we layer different multiplexed inhibitor beads in a column. We take lysates from cells, and this can be done quantitatively using Cytrac, Silac, or iTrac labeling, or you can do label-free characterization. You take the lysate, pass them over these layers of inhibitors that we call multiplex inhibitor beads in the column. We dramatically significant, are significantly enriched for the kinases. More than 60% of the proteins that bind to the multiplex inhibitor bead column are protein kinases. We then elute the kinases, trypsinize them, label them, and analyze them by mass spectrometry. 
And then the properties of multiplexed inhibitor beads is very important for us, our ability to be able to measure activation inhibition of specific kinases. The inhibitors that we've chosen are broad pan kinase inhibitors, but they're called type 1 inhibitors and in that they preferentially bind the active and not the inactive state of a kinase. So this allows us to enrich for activated forms of the kinase. So binding of kinases to MIB, these multiplex inhibitor columns containing these beads with specific pankinase inhibitors, is a function of both the affinity of the kinase for immobilized inhibitors and activation state of the kinase. And activated kinases preferentially bind to MIBs, inactive kinases do not. They can detect and quantitate acute changes in activation dependent binding of kinases in mass. This provides a tool to interrogate kinome dynamics, measure both activation and inhibition of different kinases simultaneously. They can be used to measure activation state of kinase signaling pathways, signaling networks in different cell types, tumor models, and even clinical samples from patients. And then an example of how the MIBs work is actually shown in the figure on this slide, where MIBMS, as we call it, provides an unbiased method to measure lapatinib inhibition of the EGF-HER2 regulated ERK-MAP kinase pathway. And then the data with a value of one means there would be no change in the binding of a kinase to the multiplex inhibitor B column in the presence or absence of lapatinib. A value less than one means there was less kinase bound in the presence or pretreatment of cells with lapatinib than control cells. And a value greater than one means there was increased binding of that specific kinase to the multiplex inhibitor beads with the lapatinib treatment versus control. And then what we can see is inhibition of EGFR, HER2, and the MAP kinase pathway from cell lysates of BT474 cells, a HER2 overexpressing breast cancer cell line with lapatinib treatment. But we see increased binding of HER3, and it's known from other experiments that the HER3 receptor tyrosine kinase becomes activated with inhibition of HER2 by lapatinib. So this was an unbiased method that detected the activation of HER3 with inhibition of the EGFR HER2 MAP kinase pathway. And then if we look at multiplex inhibitor beads, we've characterized each bead individually and what kinases they specifically bind to. But using a combination of multiplex inhibitor beads in the column shown on the left, we've been able to capture more than 420 of the expressed kinases out of the 518 kinases that are found in the kinome. And then kinases, as we show in, the, in this kinome tree, are captured by MIBs or represented as black dots, and they cover each different subfamily of the kinome. So using these multiplex inhibitor beads, we're able to capture members of each of the different subfamilies of the kinome and measure their activation state in a single mass spectrometry run. Now, the, the next slide shows an experiment where we use MIBs to measure the dynamic activation state of the kinome. This is a representative experiment, and this is shown as an example is a MIBMS kinome profile on the left of the kinase activity changes in response to AZD6244, a MEK inhibitor in the MAP kinase pathway currently in clinical trials. Some 159 basal-like breast cancer cells were treated with AZD6244 for different times. The cells were lysed, and the lysate was passed over the multiplexed inhibitor beads, and the eluded kinases were then identified by mass spectrometry. What we can show is that the MIBs have a significant, show a significant increased binding of many kinases in addition to the inhibition of the MAP kinase pathway. The MIB profiles were validated by immunoblotting and by receptor phosphotyrosine kinase arrays on the right. But what you see is a dynamic change in the activation as well as the inhibition of a large number of kinases using a highly selective inhibitor AZD6244 which is an allosteric inhibitor of MEK1 and MEK2, and is one of the most specific inhibitors for its kinase because it binds to a specific allosteric regulatory site rather than the ATP binding site for the kinase. And in conclusion, what we've been able to show is that multiplex inhibitor beads coupled with mass spectrometry can be used to measure the baseline activation state of the kinome in cells and tissues. It allows measurement of dynamic changes in the activation of kinases in, in mass, both activation and inhibition of kinase activities, 
in response to stimulatory and also inhibitory signals to the cell. That MIBMS shows that the kinome is highly resilient, capable of bypassing targeted inhibition of nodal kinases. The example I used was the MEK inhibitor AZD6244 that inhibited the mech erc pathway but caused the activation and also inhibition of a number of other kinases, both receptor tyrosine kinases and serine threonine kinases. So the findings that we have shown with MIBMS analysis of the kinome have significant implications for clinically used the kinase inhibitors. This explains why single agent kinase inhibitors fail to have durable responses because of the resiliency of the kinome and its ability to bypass nodal inhibition and it provides a method to test combination therapies to block the adaptive reprogramming of the kinome that occurs when you target specific nodal kinases.